Welcome everybody to our Christmas Eve by candlelight service uh, this evening. Our story begins not on earth but in heaven, not with mankind but with God because the Christmas story is first and foremost God's story. But it's not the story of a distant God, rather it's the story of the God who in the coming of Jesus Christ has become Emmanuel, God with us as Savior and as liberator of our human race. He came down to earth from heaven, who was God and Lord of all.
Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. It's a wonderful picture, isn't it, of the world as it was meant to be, the world as God created it to be, and the world, of course, that we would love it to be, perfect peace, harmony, male and female, man and nature of man with God. No wonder the next carol that we'll sing calls us to sing praises to God, our Creator, but notice when we come to the last line of this next carol, it tells another story. We're to praise God who has made heaven and earth of naught, yes, but also because he with his own blood mankind has bought. And after the carol, the next reading will begin to explain why that must be so.
Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. A curse upon human relationships, a curse upon nature, a curse upon our very lives. To dust you shall return. And that is more like the world we actually know, isn't it? And it's all because our rebellion against God has put us in bondage. Through the fear of death, people are subject to lifelong slavery. That's how the Bible puts it. But you heard God's promise, even as that curse was being pronounced, that evil would not have the last word. God himself would intervene in history through the offspring of the woman who would at last destroy the work of the devil and would liberate his people. And all down through history, that promise shone despite long ages of darkness until at last, at the first Christmas, that offspring came to save us all from Satan's power when we had gone astray.
wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonouring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Well, that makes pretty grim reading, doesn't it? People dismiss often Genesis as just uh, ancient history or even myth, but it isn't. St. Paul is presenting there exactly the same picture, just in plainer words. And both simply describe the reality of the contemporary world that you and I know only too well. How great is the world's need of saving, liberating from the darkness of our own humanity. But because of the message of Christmas, out of darkness we have light. And that's why on Christmas night all Christians sing.
there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his fruit, roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In that day, the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with recompense, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. At last, the Christ whom the prophets had faithfully foretold is born. The seed of the woman, the shoot of Jesse, the son of David. At last, he comes, as promised, with power to destroy that twisting serpent, the dragon, that terrible force of evil that lies behind all the evil in this world, to reverse the curse of sin and to make his blessings flow far as that curse had been found. And that's why Christmas is indeed a message of joy to the world.
curse banished, and a world restored to be as God created it to be. The promise of Christmas was about a great victory, which means that the world will one day be put right forever. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he did come to bring liberation. He came as promised to bring the leaping joy of ultimate freedom to enslaved human beings. Listen to these words from Malachi, the very last of the prophets, speaking as he was some 400 or so years before the birth of Christ. And then listen to what the Gospels record of the events of that first Christmas. Malachi says, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. And so it came to pass. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, Elizabeth's baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. In the Bible, there's great joy and wonder about the Christmas message, but there's absolutely no sentimentality. It is a message of real liberation, real peace descending from heaven. But, of course, real peace doesn't come to rebellious human beings without the almighty cost of making peace. And that cost is a cost to God himself. And so, or oh, that babe, still infant crying, shadows of the cross were lying. Before we think together, and I speak for a little about what all this means, Let's sing again this lovely carol about the angel's poignant message.
Well, I wonder how you would picture Christmas most perfectly. What scene for you would make the perfect Christmas card? Maybe it would be snow, a white Christmas. Don't think we're going to get one this year, but you never quite know, do you? Maybe it would be a, a lovely scene of robins or uh, a, a kind of Dickensian picture of old England. Maybe it would be Santa and his reindeer, or perhaps a star and shepherds and angels. That would perhaps be a little closer. And I guess we've all seen plenty of these uh, just this year. But I wonder if you've ever had a Christmas card picturing a leaping calf. I certainly haven't. But that is the picture that Malachi the prophet gives of Christmas yet to come. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. In our Christmas services this year, we've been looking at the promise of Christmas, according to Malachi, this last of the prophets. And uh, his view from some 400 and some years before the birth of Jesus was that that day would be like a sunrise. It would be the dawning light of ultimate meaning for our world with wings of, of righteousness, the healing wings, he calls them, of ultimate restoration for our world. But now he talks about leaping calves. What on earth does that mean? Well, it is a picture of the, the leaping joy of ultimate freedom. Calves kept in their stalls all night, kept away from their mothers during milking, perhaps, and now at last set free to go and join their mothers, to leap, to frolic with joy. Leaping speaks of, a, of extreme joy and celebration, doesn't it? I know we Scots are fairly staid raised, but even we have the Highland fling, don't we? And certainly it is a very common association in the Bible. King David leaped and danced for joy before the Lord. In the Song of Songs, that erotic love poem, the beloved comes leaping over the mountain to her beloved, joyfully anticipating that lover's tryst. And when the prophets like Isaiah spoke of the glorious coming of the Lord, he says the lame men would leap for joy even as the dumb would sing. And so here Malachi also speaks about the leaping joy of liberation, of ultimate freedom. And that would be a great, great feature of the coming of God to this earth. Freedom. Liberation from captivity and bondage. That is one of the Bible's most consistent ways of describing what salvation is all about, what it means. You go back to the very beginnings of the Old Testament and the story of the Exodus is a story of great liberation from bondage. And it became a picture of God's great salvation ever afterwards. And the prophets like, like Malachi, they pointed forward to a far, far greater liberation than that, a liberation out of the captivity of life as we know it as human beings and into the glorious liberation of nothing less than a whole new world. They look for that day of liberating joy. You shall go out with joy, we read, and be led forth in peace, and the mountains and the hills will break forth into singing, and even the trees of the field will clap their hands, such will be the joy. And that's the message of Christmas that Malachi is longing for. It will bring liberation, freedom from the dark, oppressive forces of this world that rob us of true joy and rob us of true freedom. That's what Malachi saw would begin at that first Christmas, now 2,000 years in the past for us. And that's why there was joy. That's why there was great joy all surrounding the events of Jesus' birth. And there was leaping. We heard it in the reading. Remember John the Baptist in the womb, leaping for joy when Mary came to visit Elizabeth and told her about the child in her own womb, the one who would be born as Savior. But why? Why is Christmas about liberation? What's all this about human beings like us needing to be liberated? 
Well, let me explain it in Jesus' own words. Because first, Jesus said that human beings, every one of us, is in slavery. And that we're in need of liberation. We're all slaves, he said. We're all controlled by the ruthless power and we are helpless in the grasp of a ruthless master. And he, he called that ruthless master sin. Truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Now, notice what he says there, because it's not what we tend to think of ourselves. According to Jesus, we commit sins because we are slaves to sin, because sin has a power, a hold over us. Sin isn't all the list of uh, peccadilloes and skeletons in the closet that we've all accumulated through our life and like to hide away. No, sin, according to Jesus, is a power that has us in a grip like a vice. And that's what explains so much human behavior. Some years ago, I remember reading, I think it was in one of the uh, weekend newspapers, an article by uh, the zoologist. Uh, Desmond Morris. You'll have read perhaps some of his books. And it was the time of Tiger Woods uh, when he, well, let's say, veered quite markedly off the fairway as far as his marriage was concerned and was shown up to be having multiple affairs and so on. And Desmond Morris was writing about this. And what he said was this, Tiger Woods is driven by primal instinct to spread his genes wildly. As though that sort of made it all okay. Well, Tiger Woods' wife clearly didn't think it was okay. I read that his divorce settlement cost him $750 million. But there is a grain of truth, a grain of truth in Desmond Morris's words. The Bible, though, explains it much more clearly and much more fully. Of course, we are all responsible for our actions. Of course, we are all moral beings. We're not just animals. But, yes, we are in the grip of base and evil powers. Not primeval instincts as though some things like that were just natural and somehow innocent and therefore excusable. But Jesus says we are in the grip of the power of sin. And it is far from natural and it is far from good and innocent. And he says, yes, we are in slavery to its mastery. We are not free because otherwise, our world would be marked in every relationship, not by infidelity, but by total fidelity, wouldn't it? And divorce lawyers would be out of a job. Our world would be marked not by deceit, but by honesty in all things. And so, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs would be out of a job. Our world would be marked not by suspicion, but by trust in every relationship in the world. And so the foreign office and the diplomats would all be out of a job. And our world would be marked not by wars, but by peace between all nations. And NATO could be disbanded because it wasn't needed, not just because Mr. Trump might not want to pay for it. Well, let me ask you, is that the world as it really is? Well, you know the answer to that, don't you? Of course you do. But Jesus says this world is as it is because we human beings are enslaved. We are captive to the power of sin. It is an alien intrusion into true humanity. Now, we tend to use euphemisms. But we recognize it all the same. We say, well, that's human nature. What we mean is, well, we're far from perfect. Isn't that right? And St. Paul echoes the Lord Jesus in his letter to the church in Rome. He, he describes that dark power of sin. He describes it as a harsh master, as a brutal general, as a tyrannical ruler domineering us, and as a vicious employer who's exploiting us, subjugating our human lives to de-joy them and indeed to dehumanize them. That's a consistent message from the, the beginning of the Bible right to the very end, that we human beings are not free. We're in slavery, and we are in desperate need of liberation. Now, you might very well be saying to yourself, hang on a minute, what are you talking about? 
you just had too much of that Christmas mulled wine. That is nonsense. You might be saying, we're not slaves. At least I'm not a slave. I'm a free, I'm a free person. This is a, a relatively free country. I can live my life the way I want to. I'm free. And I will do it my way. And how dare you infer that I'm some kind of slave, that I'm in bondage. What a cheek. Well, I'm just reporting Jesus' words and his view. And actually, that's, that's the very response that he got when he first spoke them back then. People said to him, we are offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How dare you say we're needing freeing? What a cheek. No, said Jesus in reply, you are absolutely wrong. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And that is most certainly the contention of Jesus Christ. Well, maybe you say, well, so what? But who says I ever sin? Well, come on. Are you really perfect? Are you always the person that you really want to be? You never let others down? Do you never let yourself down? If that really is the case, please come and see me afterwards. I'd like to take you onto our church staff because we've never had anybody like that and I've never met anybody like that myself. I'm certainly not like that. Let me ask you this. Are we really as free as we think we are? Are we really joyfully liberated as people to be everything that we can be, everything we want to be, everything we long to be in life? The Bible's contention is that we're not. St. Paul says that by nature we are enslaved to things that by nature are not God's. St. Peter says, whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. These things are not really God's. These things have no power to help us. And yet we look to them for the fulfillment, for the salvation that we long for. We look to them to give us liberation. But these things we know have no power to save us. But the irony is they do have power to enslave us and to condemn us. Most years I, I visit India. And uh, when I go there, I see every time people worshiping, giving homage, giving money to idols, to animals. I've even seen them giving money to trees literally in bondage to idols made by the imagination of man. And people in the West might scoff at that, but let me tell you, we in the secular West are really no different at all because I know many, many people who are in just the same kind of bondage to things that have no power whatsoever to liberate them, to bless them. Artists and intellectuals, who so often are slaves to the great quest for meaning and expression. Many, many people are slaves to the great quest for wealth to find liberation and salvation. Or many are seeking liberation and fulfillment through their relationships, through a lover, through a spouse, through their children, whatever it might be, or through finding their identity in their particular way of wanting to express fashion or express their sexuality, for example. The latest tragic fashion seems to be that people will even mutilate their bodies in a quest for happiness by identifying as a different gender to the body that they have. There are very powerful masters that abound in our 21st century culture, controlling people with great power, with great persistence, be it beauty or body shape, or gender expression, or academic success, or sporting image, or wealth, or whatever it might be. Sometimes it's just the desire, isn't it, to be liked, to be loved at school, or to be loved by someone special. I don't think I'm exaggerating, am I? That's, that's all around us. Powerful masters craving our worship, and ruthless masters Powerful to condemn for failure all too easily and all too quickly. 
And the fallout is all around about us in our society. All the tragedies of these poor people who have been spat out, who have been rejected by these gods that they've looked to to be their saviors. People desperately seeking liberation from the, the dreadful tyranny through escapism into alcohol or into drugs or even through suicide. Suicide is still the biggest killer of young men in our culture today. Isn't that a, a terrible thing? And by the way, the suicide rate among those people who have had gender reassignment surgery is 20 times the rate in the normal population. Is that liberation? One of the most awful tragedies, I think, is when we read about young children taking their own lives because they felt crushed or excluded by their peers at school just because they fell short somehow of the ruthless standards of the, of the fashion gods or the popularity gods or the looks gods that rule in teenage culture. I'm not at all sure that any of us can really claim that we're as free as we like to think we are. And there's certainly one master, isn't there, that I don't think any of us can deny has an icy grip over our lives. And that's the master of death itself. None of us, I think, can deny that we're slaves to our own mortality, can we? I find Woody Allen sometimes very witty and penetrating. Some of his wittiest sayings are actually about life itself. Listen. Life is full of misery, loneliness, and suffering, and it's all over much too soon. Or this, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it through not dying. Well, that's funny and witty, isn't it? But there's a serious edge to it. Here's one that's just plain and stark. No humor, I think, at all. Just dark. He says, alienation, loneliness, and emptiness verging on madness. The fundamental thing behind all motivation and all activity is the constant struggle against annihilation and death. It is absolutely stupefying in its terror, and it renders anyone's accomplishments meaningless. That is just, friends, a recognition of what Jesus says, that we are all captives to many, many ruthless powers that have a hold on our lives. And above all others, the power of death itself. And Jesus says, we are all in slavery. And we are all in need of liberation. But second, he tells us that the message of Christmas is that Jesus is also the Savior who came to bring liberation. The truth about me, says Jesus, is what will set you free. And if the Son of God sets you free, then you will be free indeed. You see, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ liberates us because it faces head on the whole truth about time and eternity. It recognizes it. It doesn't hide from the awful reality of, of sin's enslaving power over the human heart and over our whole human world. But it also recognizes and it rejoices in the wonderful reality of the Savior's liberating power to set us free, to liberate our human hearts, to liberate the whole human world if it will be liberated. That's what Jesus Christ's coming into this world is all about. He came to bring liberation, to set us free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death, is how the Apostle Paul puts it, to deliver us from the dominion of darkness and transfer us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, a total liberation because it's a total rescue from the power and the sway of the great tyrant itself, the power of sin. Some of you will remember, perhaps, 27 years ago this very night, that the world witnessed the overthrow of the tyrant Ceausescu in Romania. And on Christmas morning, 1989, he and his wife were executed, and the world news bulletins showed those pictures of him and his wife crumpled by that wall, dead bodies, amid a cheering crowd of people full of the joy of liberation from that tyrannical regime, from darkness, from tyranny, from bondage, 
And there was the rejoicing that began the beginning of a whole new era of free existence. But the first Christmas, 2,000 years ago, saw a far, far greater liberation begin. With the beginning of total and ultimate liberation from this world. Waking up to overcoming the power of sin itself. But you might say, how is that? Because death is still here. Even Christians die just the same as everybody else. Well, yes, that's true. And the Bible is very clear and unembarrassed about that. It tells us there's a not yet about our salvation. And that is because the liberation that comes in Jesus is not just a personal liberation for men and women. It is a truly cosmic liberation for this whole world, the whole cosmos. This whole creation is waiting, is groaning, says the Apostle Paul, longing for the great day of consummation when the dead are raised at Christ's return. And the same Spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will raise all those who are His likewise. And all will at last be complete. Nevertheless, meantime, that great liberation has begun. Because we who trust the Lord Jesus, we know that that day is certain. And we know the joy, therefore, of that liberation. We know it already in our lives. We're no longer slaves. We're not yet full inheritors, but we have the certainty because we have become true heirs. And we live on the basis of, of what we know is promised to be ours one day. That's the definition of an heir. You live knowing that the inheritance will certainly be yours. We live, as it were, like a football team that's already qualified for the World Cup and has a whole lot of games left in the group. And the team is liberated, therefore. They don't have to worry about losing goals. They're able to play the greatest football ever because they know they're already there in the finals. And that's what Christmas means. For all who fear his name, says Malachi, who love and know the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a, a certainty of a future full of the leaping joy of ultimate freedom. And that day is not yet, but even now there's joy in the knowledge of that liberation to come because we're liberated from the fear of death itself. And because we're liberated from that, we can therefore be liberated from every other stultifying tyranny that would have hold over our lives here in this world. We're liberated from the need for others' approval and praise. What a bondage that is to be liberated from. We're liberated from the burden of, of self-judgment, of self-esteem. We're liberated from the tyranny of a need to achieve, a need to possess, a need to perform, a need to be something for somebody. So we're free. Free to rejoice in being what God has so wonderfully made us to be and called us to be in Jesus Christ. Friends, it's that truth in its entirety, the hard, unpalatable truth about sin's enslaving power and the glorious truth about the Savior's liberating power. It's that truth that will set you leaping for joy this Christmas time. Indeed, all the time. If you'll accept it, if you'll receive it from the lips of of the Savior, Jesus Christ. If you haven't done that yet, won't you make it yours this Christmas Eve? You do. You will know the truth. And the truth will set you free with the leaping joy of ultimate freedom that Jesus longs to give you, longs to give each one of you personally, now and forever, if you will say, Amen, Lord, so let it be. My prayer is that you will this very Christmas time. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, risen and reigning forever, grant us, we pray, to receive this year your 
living and liberating gospel word so that we might also rejoice in the true freedom that you and you alone can give, but which you promise to give to all who knock, to all who ask, to all who seek from you, the King to be our Savior. Hear us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing as we close a hymn that speaks of the story of God's searching love from the councils of eternity through the birth and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and still calling us today in councils of eternity before all worlds were formed. Do stay behind. There'll be a coffee and tea and mulled wine and so on downstairs and uh, mince pies. And if you don't have to rush, uh, we'd love for you to do that.
love you also to join with us tomorrow if you're able. We have our morning Sunday service for Christmas Day here at 11 o'clock, uh, and all will be welcome. Uh, and also, we have a course beginning in the new year, in the early new year, called Life Explored. If you would like to find out a little more about the things we've been thinking about this evening, it begins here on the 19th of January, that's a Thursday, at 7 o'clock in the evening for dinner, and an opportunity to watch a couple of films and uh, to discuss some of the things uh, that we've been presenting this evening. We have some of these little Luke's Gospels as well, and uh, these little books have a happy Christmas. And if you'd like to take one of these, we'd be delighted for you to take one and perhaps read it uh, in a quiet moment if there is such a thing uh, later on on Christmas Day when uh, the Christmas dinner has gone down. We'd love you to take one of these and read for yourself the words of Jesus Christ and his works as reported by those who saw with their own eyes what he said and what he did. Let me wish you a very happy and blessed Christmas. And as we depart together, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the light of your life that shone into this world in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the light shines in the darkness, and the dark not, darkness cannot overcome it, so we pray that that light would overcome every dark in our hearts and draw each one of us here to the light that is in Jesus and Jesus alone. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.